Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to this NHR webinar on the pre-doctoral fellowships. Um, so what we're going to go and be doing in the next hour is we're going to be talking through the scheme, uh, just give you an overview of what it's all about um, in terms of eligibility criteria, how you apply, and a few hints and tips for doing so. Uh, so David's going to talk through that, um, and I'll, David will introduce himself in a second. Um, so I'm Pete Thompson, and I'm an assistant director here for personal awards at the NHR Academy, and David, my, my colleague. Yeah, I'm a senior program manager um, in charge of the pre-doctoral fellowships. So if any one of you have already asked some questions towards me, then hopefully I've got back to you. So what we'll do is, say, David will talk through some, some slides now with the details of the scheme and then the rest of the time uh, of the webinar till around two o'clock, we will spend answering your questions. So hopefully you can see on the webinar software how to ask questions of us. So I'd encourage you to type in your questions as we're going through, as they come up. Um, and then when we get to the end of the uh, end of the slides, we'll try and get through as many questions as, as we can in the time that we have available. So please do send us lots in and hopefully we'll get everything covered. So I'm going to hand over to David and he's going to start us off by talking through the, the pre-doctoral fellowships. Over to you, David. Thanks, Pete. Um, yeah, so first of all, I just want to give you a bit of a, an overview of the NHR research training uh, schemes that we do offer. Uh, so we offer a range of schemes ranging for different um, specialities. So for doctors and dentists, we have the in-practice fellowships and all the way through uh, clinical lectureships. Um, we also have a scheme specifically for healthcare professionals. So people who want to become clinical academics, uh, we offer a number of different schemes for them. And then also the main focus of what we'll be talking about today uh, which is the Fellowships for All scheme, in which the pre-doctoral fellowships fits in. So the, the sort of clue is in the name that this these um, this run of fellowships is for, for everyone um, and not a specific sort of clinician or medically trained applicant. So I'll say we're going to focus on the Fellowships for All scheme and this scheme can take you all the way through from pre-doctoral level uh, through to your doctoral level where you're um, going to achieve your PhD, then through onto all the, our postdoctoral um, schemes, the advanced fellowships, where this covers a range of dis different uh, stages of your uh, research career. And then finally on to our most uh, prestigious award, which is the research professorship. We also have an, another scheme in there, which is the Development Skills Enhancement Award, which is for postdoctoral um, applicants to dip into to do some uh, training and um, development to get them through to the next stage of their academic career. So again, so I've basically just talk, talked you through this, but this is just the, the model sort of um, highlighted from the pre-doctoral level through the doctoral and finally through to the research professorship. Um, the new schemes that we're offering uh, are quite different to the old ones, but they do offer exactly the same as what we, we used to offer, but it's just more in a condensed package, which makes it a bit more open to everyone, a bit easier for people to apply to the right scheme, and also makes it a bit more flexible uh, for people who, um, who would like to, uh, to apply for it. Um, so again, focusing on the pre-doctoral fellowship, because that's what you, all, you are all here to listen to. Um, we used to have a number of different research methods programs, such as the fellowships, uh, systematic review fellowships, and a number of different masters uh, in economics of health and medical statistics. So these have all been repackaged into the pre-doctoral fellowship and we've also included a number of different other um, research methodology specialists. So moving on to the actual scope of the pre-doctoral fellowship. So the aim of this, uh, this fellowship is really for people who have aspirations to work in specifically one of the areas listed uh, that you can see here, ranging from medical statistics, health economics, uh, clinical trial design, all the way through to qualitative research and mixed methods. Um, what the fellowship isn't for is for people who just wish to wish to dip into some research methodology training and then go back to their clinical or their medical roles. It's very much targeted at those people who want to have a career or going to do a PhD in uh, research methodology. Um, so this the fellowship is designed to target uh, mainly two people or uh, uh, two applicants in in have a different stage of their career. So firstly, it can be used to have a completion of a broad level master's um, training, uh, training program, uh, one of the areas listed before, um, which would allow people to have to go into uh, work at 
for example, a clinical trials unit or as a health economist, uh, economist uh, supporting other research teams. Or it was it is there to uh, for applicants to complete master's levels training and then go on to complete a, a future PhD in, in an area that will utilise uh, the type of research methodology training that you'll have gained uh, through this pre-doctoral fellowship. So this, they're the sort of two areas that we're trying to really target with this fellowship. So it's probably just worth, uh, worth saying, David, that it's, it's, not, um, it's not an expectation with this one that you would necessarily go on to do a PhD afterwards, mm -hmm. unlike some of our other fellowships, like the Pre-Doctoral Clinical Academic Fellowship, the PCAF Fellowship, which is a separate award, and our Academic Clinical Fellowship, our ACF, where an expectation from those is you very much would go on to do a PhD. Um, as you were just saying, it's, yeah. it's, it's a broader range um, that we're looking for with this fellowship. So um, don't be put off applying if you're thinking at this early stage of your career. Actually, I don't know if I want to go and do a PhD yet. You might just be thinking, as, as, as David just outlined, I, I quite like the idea of becoming a medical statistician and working for a, tr a trials unit, for example, but not necessarily going on to do a PhD. So And, that, and that's fine. Yeah, thanks, Pete. Um, and so, because of this, we have a number of eligibility criteria. Because it's a fairly um, early on in people's career uh, type type fellowship, we, we are asking people that they have at least a completion of a relevant first degree. Uh, the proposed host, um, so as part of the fellowship, you must have a host that is willing to employ you for the duration of the award. And that proposed host must be an English higher education institute, so a university, for example or an NHS body or another provider of health or care services. Um, and also as part of your application, as, as we've sort of uh, alluded to earlier, is that you must be proposing, uh, proposing to develop a career as a methodologist in one of the, uh, those areas that we've listed or go on to do a PhD. Um, and again, the choice is, is yours as part of this fellowship. And also, you can't have already registered or completed a PhD in one of the relevant areas. Um, so because there's an expectation that you might progress to a PhD, uh, you can't have already registered one. But obviously that's different if you uh, uh, want to continue in a, a research methodology career. Um, so we just want to highlight, because we have had a number of applicants that we've noticed who um, are very much from a clinical background uh, applying for this pre doctoral fellowship. And um, this the, the fellowship we're talking about today is very similar to the pre-doctoral clinical academic fellowship so there's a number of key differences uh, between these two fellowships so the PCAF so the clinical academic fellowship is for clinicians who want to aspire to be clinical academics whereas the pre-doctoral fellowship which we're talking about today is for aspiring research methodologists uh, the PCAF you can also split your clinical work and academic training as part of the fellowship whereas the pre-doctoral fellowship is very much on the academic training um, and also the um, the PCAF you can include a varied amount of clinical training and also academic training as part of the fellowship whereas at the pre-doctoral fellowship uh, you must only include uh, academic training and development so no sort of clinical skills should be part of the, the application and again as Pete said uh, in the PCAF you are expected to progress onto a PhD and through your clinical academic career, whereas in the pre-doctoral fellowship, you can either do that or you can just go on to have a career in research methodology. So they're the sort of key differences that we just wanted to highlight between the two schemes because they are sort of very similar in terms of uh, the guidance. Mm -hmm. So as part of the, the pre-doctoral fellowship, um, the funding and support that we do offer is between one to two years uh, work time equivalent. Um, so this must be sort of the length of the award that you you request should reflect the amount of training that's needed for your next stage so that's completely up to you but it must be very much justified in your application mm -hmm. um, you can use uh, you can decide whether it's between 50 or 100 percent work time equivalent and these can go up in um, different percentage increments so it can go 55 60 65 percent 70 percent and so on so for example if you were doing a 18 month award say for instance you would have done a 12 months masters then you wanted a further six month training in a certain area but then you selected that it was going to be at 50 percent work time equivalent the total length of your award would be 36 months so this can range in different in different ways as well so it does offer that sort of flexibility that uh, maybe perhaps our previous awards didn't offer as part of the application or as part of the fellowship 
we will provide salary for the full duration of the award. We also fund a full master's course cost up to the UK and EU standard rate. We have a further um, training costs for up to uh, £5,000 with £1,000 conference fees included. And also we have some supervision and mentorship costs for up to £1,000. So they're the things that we, that's, that we fund and, and we support. Um, because of the, um, the fellowship and the stage of the, the career we're expecting our applicants to be at, we're expecting our supervisors to have quite a hands-on role in both the application and in the training development of, of the fellowship. Um, and because of this, because it's a quite a research, uh, well, it is a research methodologically uh, orientated fellowship, uh, we expect at least one supervisor to have expertise in research methodology so they can truly support you um, throughout the, the duration of the award. Um, if you haven't already identified a supervisor, we do have uh, on the website a list of a number of different supervisory teams or supervisory options. So there's lists for uh, UK clinical trials units who have shown an interest um, in supporting applicants during this uh, fellowship or a number of different people who, uh, who have been part of the NIHR previously who would like to support um, applicants. So please go on to that to, to have a look and maybe try and find a supervisor. Or alternatively, if you've got a supervisor and they're not on the list, that list, that's absolutely fine. Um, as long as I say that they, they realise the, the sort of the hands-on um, part of the fellowship they need to play and also they have these expertise in the research methodology that you have, um, you are going to put forward to in your application. Um, so there's a number of things uh, what will be assessed, assessed as part of your application, and that depends on where you are in your uh, research or academic career. Um, so we're expecting quite a range of people who have people who've came straight out of their undergraduate degree to people who've maybe already been working in a sort of clinical trials unit. Um, so what will be assessed will be dependent on where you are now and where you want to be after the end of your fellowship. Um, and also whether you've already got a master's degree or whether you haven't. So I'm not going to read all these and the, the slide will be available later, but the sort of main difference is just looking at what experience you have and then what experience you're trying to gain through your fellowship um, and being able to sort of demonstrate that. Uh, the other part of the assessment will also be your supervisory team and your host organisation as well. So whether they are able and, and capable to uh, supervise you through your, through your fellowship. So they're the main areas that will be assessed. And as I say, the slides will be available later if you want to read them in more detail. And I think these also make up part of the, um, the guidelines that are on our website. So just moving on to the assessment process. So the competition launched at the start of um, February um, and the competition closing date is the 24th of April at 1pm. So please make sure that all applications are all signed and everything's all signed off by your supervisors, your finances and your host organisation by the 1pm deadline, if not before, hopefully. Um, what happens then to your applications is that uh, people like myself and other programme managers will be checking the applications for the eligibility criteria that you've met and also whether it fits within the NIHR remit, which is also available to view on the website. We will then pass our um, applications over to the selection committee where we'll have a number of reviewers reviewing each application. Following on from the, the reviewing of the application, so they will go through a number of different things, which uh, I'll show you how they will assess it uh, in the next couple of slides. Um, following the review stage, we will go to a funding recommendation meeting where all of the selection committee me uh, members will be sat in a room deciding which applications to fund. Following on from this, you will get notified whether you've been awarded the, the uh, fellowship or not. Um, that would be looking, I believe, towards the funding recommendations around around July. July. Yeah, so you probably hear sort of towards the end of July, uh, towards the beginning of August. It does sometimes take a few weeks because um, with all our funding for these awards coming from the Department of Health and Social Care, all, all the decisions have to be ratified and agreed through them um, and to confirm the, confirm the money, basically. So we, you would have to wait a couple of weeks after the, after that meeting takes place until you'd hear. So likely, likely to be the end of July. Yeah. Um, so just a few tips and hints that we're going to go through now. So from pre-application through to uh, just before submitting your application. Um, 
so as you're going through the process now um, and before you really start getting into it so this will be more targeted at people who are maybe looking to apply in future or those who are sort of going through the process just now is that you need to sort of understand what the actual process is have a look at the website look at past um, um, past awards and also past webinars as well because although the schemes offer different things a lot of the schemes are very similar in terms of how they might be assessed and what we're looking for in terms of meeting the NIHR remit and also read the guidelines to make sure that you fit well within the eligibility criteria and also it's important to sort of know who you're uh, applying to so the panel members uh, people who have held these rewards previously just to see what the sort of caliber of awards are that have been submitted to the NHR so it's just let you know where about you sit uh, within the scale and also it's important to start early uh, so start identifying your supervisors start identifying people that you'll be able to chat to and work with and also speak to a lot of people uh, other NIHR Academy members who maybe know the process of NIHR and how um, how the awards are, are granted and just consider all options so if you're just in one institute maybe I'll have a look elsewhere and also within the same institute other departments might be looking at um, doing similar things so I think the, the key here is just ask lots of questions whether it's to us at the NIHR or to supervisors or mentors around you just ask lots of questions and, and seek guidance from anyone you can uh, so in terms of the application uh, the main things we'll be looking for or the, the panel will be looking for is looking at the trajectory of the person so how where you are at present how the pre-doctoral fellowship application will get you get you to where you want to be obviously that needs to be within the scope of the fellowship so it's all about describing the journey how the different types of the training of the fellowship that you're um, you're putting in your application will get you to where you want to be and just making sure that it's all fairly sensible and there's nothing sort of too outlandish in there I guess um, and again it's it's a lot focused on the training here so make sure that it actually meets the need of the candidate and, and the, uh, the the project or the application that you'll be working on uh, and again we will be uh, the panel will be assessing the the host and the environment and the, and the supervisory team um, as part of your application so just make sure that you understand uh, that you well make sure you've got the correct supervisors in place and if maybe your main supervisor doesn't have expertise in an area you're expecting to go into then make sure you get someone on board that does have these uh, and also chat a lot to your finance lead they'll be able to help you out with um, what you should be putting in the finance or what would need to be involved in the application uh, so if you haven't spoke to them already I suggest you go and do that as there's often things that um, you maybe haven't taken into consideration that will need to be included in the application um, as part of the finance side of things so make sure you're, you're chatting to those people as well at your institute And finally, for the um, final bit of the application, uh, make sure that everyone's in place, make sure that no one's on holiday, make sure no one's on annual leave if you're expecting them to sign it off that next day, or at least check when their deadlines are. I think the, uh, the worst possible thing is probably getting to deadline day and realising your, um, your finance signatory or um, your head of department is off and is unable to sign it. So make sure you, you put a deadline in for when they'll be around to be able to sign off your uh, application form and finally don't miss the deadline uh, the, there isn't really much room for maneuver in that so um, make sure you get your application done in time um, and for that 24th of April at 1pm um, there's a number of uh, frequency uh, frequently asked questions as well uh, that although some of you might be asking now uh, we just thought we'd try and um, to, to, to answer in advance is uh, we've had a quite a few people asking if international students are eligible um, and yes as part of eligibility concerns they are eligible for the fellowship however they need to have the correct permits uh, in place to work and study in the UK throughout the whole duration of their award um, and this would be decided well this would be arranged between the applicant and the host um, and it's worth noting that we would only ever fund student fees uh, so for master's courses up to the current rate for the UK and EU student uh, level um, and we've had a lot of clinic uh, as, as we mentioned earlier we've had a few people who are clinically or medically qualified asking if they're eligible um, it's not really an eligibility question um, it'll be for the selection committee to, uh, 
to assess the suitability. However, you have to make it clear that your future will be in uh, research methodology and it's not something you're just trying to pick up some skills in this area and going back to your clinical or medical uh, work. Um, and again, I've already touched on how you find a supervisor. So there's a list of potential supervisors um, on our website, or you can just approach someone who you think would be suitable and, uh, um, and see if they could um, offer you guidance and supervision throughout the, throughout the fellowship. So they're the main questions that we've been asked um, periodically while the, the uh, fellowship's been open. Um, but we're, as Pete said, we're open to uh, answer any questions now for the next 40 minutes or until we get to the end of the good list of questions that we've already got. Um, there's our details. If you do have any questions, uh, please just pick up the phone or give us an email. We're all, always happy to help. Brilliant. So thanks very much. Brilliant. Thanks, David. Um, so yeah, we've now got um, that's a good bit of time to answer your questions that have been coming in as David's been speaking. So thank you for that. Um, so I'm going to kick off with the first question, which sort of touches on a little bit what David was just saying about eligibility for this and other pre-doctoral schemes. And this is, can you apply to both pre-doctoral schemes and by both I'm, I'm assuming the question here is the pre-doctoral fellowship is what I'm talking about today and the pre-doctoral clinical academic fellowship which is the PCAF. Um, whilst you can I think if you were looking to apply for both it would probably mean that one of them wasn't suitable if that makes sense they both they are both for different purposes so the pre-doctoral fellowship that we're talking about today is very much about people who are looking to go on to develop a career as a research methodologist um, as David says, you can come from a clinical background, um, but it would be more, you would be using this as a as more of a career change to then go on to become a, a methodologist, such as a medical statistician, a health economist, uh, or whatever. Whereas a pre-doctoral clinical academic fellowship, the PCAF, that is very much for people who are looking to develop as clinical academics. So you, 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 they are quite different in terms of what they're, what they're aiming to do, if that makes sense. So. I would not advise that you would apply for both. I would advise you, you select the one which is best suited for where you see yourself going in your career. So the next question we've had is, if someone hasn't finished their master's degree, um, are they, can they apply? Um, yes is the short answer. Yeah. Um, this is, as David is outlining, there's, you can you can sort of come into this in either with someone who has, have, already has a master's degree and wants to do some more training in advance of them maybe going on to do a PhD or you can come in and use it to undertake a master's degree but if you're someone who's sort of in the middle of that then yes that's absolutely that's absolutely fine. Uh, the, the next question is once I have identified a HEI host to higher education institute as part of the pre-doctoral fellowship um, can I seek to do a master's degree at another university um, Again, the short answer is yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. That's. I mean, that's absolutely fine. We'd encourage you to look at the, the master's course, which is best suited for the type of training and that you want to undertake, and where you see yourself being at the end of it. So, if your interest is in becoming a, say, a clinical trialist or working with a, a clinical trials unit, um, mm. maybe undertaking a master's in clinical trials might be. A, a good use of the fellowship and there's a number of institutions up and down the country who provide that sort of course um again for med medical stats if you're if you they see, see yourself wanting to do a uh, medical statistics uh, master's course then there's a, a number of universities uh, some of which nihr has, has funded master's places on in the past um which you can have a look at um to see which one would be most suited for you uh, next question is um, so someone who's working currently as a health economics modeler um, and have finished their MSc in health economics previously um, and they're asking if this is still relevant to me. Uh, again, the short answer is yes. Um, yeah, you can yeah. everyone to take, take that one, but yeah, you yes. don't so much about PhD really. I yeah, exactly. So, I mean, it depends on what which way you want to take your next steps in your career. So whether it's moving on to a PhD, you could use this to start some more training that will make you uh, more competitive to go on to a, um, apply for a PhD at the next stage. Or if you did feel as though you required more training other than the masters in a certain area um, to go on to a career in, sort of, was it the health economics? Yeah, health, health economics. Yeah, I think health yeah, and yeah, economics yeah. then. You could use this to do some more training in that area. Um, again, it's more about describing 
how this fellowship is going to help you to get to that next stage in your career, whether that is a PhD or whether that is working within uh, health economics. So yeah, absolutely, yes. That's mm. Yeah, I mean, I think all, with all of this, the, 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 the big thing the panel is going to be looking at, as well as obviously the quality of the training programme and you as an applicant, is what's the value that we're going to get out of the investment in this? So if spending two, spending the money of training someone for two years, what at the end of that uh, do we basically get back and by get back i mean sort of in the in the more general uh, sense in that we've trained someone who's in a strong position to go on mm -hmm. to do a phd and that's a sound investment if, it, if we've trained someone who's who's um going to be working in a clinical trials unit working on the types of um trials that nhr would fund in, in in other programs then yes again that's a that's a good investment so it's it's really about saying to the panel this is what i want to use my fellowship for and this is the difference it's going to make to me over the course of, of that one to two years time. So we just really try and make that come across as to where, where you see this fellowship adding value to your career and what you want to use it for afterwards. Um, we've had a couple of questions around um, salary. So David mentioned earlier about talking to your finance lead early on. So that's, that's important to get that right. But um, these are fellowships as, as opposed to studentships. So um, you, you would be expected to be employed by the institution where you're going to be based for the fellowship. So if, say if you're, I use Leeds as the example because that's just where, well, that's where we're based, but if you were going to be based at the University of Leeds, for example, for the fellowship, you would be employed by the University of Leeds on a suitable pay scale um, that the university would have. So um, that's why it's important to talk to the finance lead because they can, they can best advise you on on, on what that should be and obviously they'll depending on what experience you already come in with will depend on the type of salary that or the type of salary scale that you would be put on uh, so the next question um can you give us some examples of what you'd write as a supervision cost um in terms of the actual finance form itself you don't necessarily need to give too many specifics about the costs of supervision for the form because we're saying that it's a thousand yeah. pounds contribution to supervisory costs so the the actual costs of, of supervision for a two-year fellowship may well be more than that but this is more of a this is a this is a contribution to that so what we would generally expect to see is that people would include this cost and it would just be it would be included as part of the fellowship but you don't necessarily have to have to justify what it's it, what it's there for. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you you the panel is going to be more assessing the, the the supervision in terms of is it the right expertise, um, is it the the board does it cover the broad range of training that you're wanting to do uh, rather than necessarily just define the finance cost if that makes yep. makes sense. Uh, someone's asked about PCAF. Um, yeah, okay, David can. Probably say where you can get some more information on that. So yeah, so that'll just be on our uh, website. So next to where the drop down box for the IHR fellowships are, there should be a list of the, the PCAF. So you should find the, um, the guidance notes in there as well. And also just email the IHR Academy and uh, the team who lead the PCAF um, fellowship will also be able to ask, answer any questions mm -hmm. for you. Um, I don't think there's any. Yeah, 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 no, that, 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 that's right. And just, I, I, I've looked a bit further down the list of questions. Someone's asked about closing dates. Um, so, so the PCAF um, uh, award that that has a closing date of the eleventh of April. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's different from this one. So pre-doctoral fellowships is the the twenty fourth of April, as, as as David outlined. So, um, if you if you're seeing a closing date of the eleventh of April, that's for that's for PCAF, not for this one. I know. Yeah, and I would say that if you applied to the wrong uh, pre-doctoral fellowship. Um, then don't worry, the, the form's fairly similar. The mm. probably process behind it is slightly different because it's meant to be clinical or academic. But in terms of what you're putting in there, probably isn't too dissimilar. So I won't stress too much, but have a look at the, the yeah, application yeah. forms and the guidance notes for the PCAF if you are thinking you've filled in the wrong one. Yeah, you would have to do a separate form just to yeah. just to be just to be clear. So if you think if you're listening to this and thinking, oops, yes, I, I it's the PCAF I'm really interested in, and you've started a pre-doctoral fellowship, as David says. You can you can transfer across your any work that you've done so far, but it should be, yeah, make please make sure you you submit it using the, the correct form. Yeah, and make sure that you're reading the correct guidance notes as well, because um, I know I think we've had some examples where people have been reading the guidance notes for the pre-doctoral fellowship to fill in the 
uh, pre-doctoral clerical, uh, the pre-calf mm-hmm. uh, fellowship. So just make sure you, you're sort of matching them up right because we know it's fairly easy to, to mix them two mm-hmm. up. Uh, someone's asked a question, can I apply if I'm already in the first year of a PhD? Um, no would be, the, would be the short answer to this. No, if you are already registered for, for a PhD, um, it, both, well, all, all of our pre-doctoral fellowships really would, would, not, be, would not be suitable. Um, we do have a separate doctoral fellowship, um, which we haven't really touched on today, but David mentioned it briefly at the beginning, um, which is a fully funded fellowship to undertake a PhD. So if you are already registered for a PhD, I would very much encourage you to have a look at our doctoral fellowship as, as that would be the most suitable one for you. Yeah, and as part of the doctoral fellowship, you can add in training and development as part of the fellowship. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if it's because you just want to uh, get some more training in research methodology, then the doctoral fellowship should offer you that as well. Um, Another question around salary, uh, I think this might be sort of specific for someone who's maybe doing a master's course in the first year and then working in the university um, afterwards in terms of gaining further experience uh, following on from their master's course. Um, as I said, even for, the, even for the master's part of the fellowship, you should still be employed by the university or whichever is your host. So you would expect you to be on a, in a salaried position for both undertaking the master's course and any subsequent training you do as part of your role afterwards. But again, talk to your finance person at your host organisation. If you're not sure who that is, um, your supervisor will, will certainly will know. So talk to your talk to your supervisor if you're not sure who that is. They should help. They should be helping you with, with things like this. Uh, someone has asked, can your supervisor work at your sponsor organisation, i.e. be your employer slash line manager? Um, Yes is the short answer. Um, David talked about the assessment that the panel make in terms of your supervisory team. Um, and they will look that if you're proposing, for example, to do a lot of training around medical statistics, that you have suitable medical statistics supervision. Um, so make sure whoever is on your supervisory team does have the correct experience, is able to con- contribute their time to you. So. By that I mean if you've got a supervisor who is very, very senior, very, very busy, um, yes, they might be very um, uh, experienced and, and have the right, the right skills in that sense, but they may also not necessarily have the time to put enough hours into the supervisor, supervision that you need. Um, so do consider that carefully and that's, you are able to have more than one person yeah. as well. So I'd, I'd make, make the most of that in terms of getting the right mix of yeah. people. If, you, if, you're not, if you're not sure, if you're, if you're concerned about that, say, please do get in touch. We can give you some more specific yeah. advice on that. I mean, David mentioned the, the the details on the website of of people who are interested in being supervisors. Um, so if you if you're struggling to identify a suitable supervisor, then I'd, I'd recommend looking through through that list. And everybody who's on there has sort of signed up to say they're interested, and will be happy to be approached. So um, yeah, if you've not got somebody, that's a that's yeah. a, a good place to to start. I guess it'll be worth mentioning now as well. Supervisors can have actually more than one, um, more than one applicant, or sort of they can supervise more than one uh, applicant. Mm-hmm. Uh, but obviously, it just needs to be bear in mind the amount of time they've got. Um, but yeah, so if you're struggling and you think, oh, that, that supervisor would be great, but they've already got someone, then speak to the supervisor. If they feel as though they've got enough time and uh, to supervise two students, then that's absolutely fine as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, this one's a good question. Someone's asked, is the research area you're interested in sort of part of the assessment process? Um, yes, it is partially, although it's not explicitly stated like that. We're, we're, we're saying the training and development programme that you're putting together is the effectively the bit that's being assessed. But um, if you're, the, the research that you may do as part of that is obviously part of the wider training and development programme. So if you are saying, I want to go on to train to become a medical statistician or I want to, um, I, I've already done a master's in medical stats and I want to do some training to get me in a suitable position to apply for a PhD. The panel will make a judgment of if, if any sort of research project that's built into your training programme is a suitable training vehicle for what you want to use it for. So um, that's why when David mentioned about things like NHRV, if you are doing research, it should be within 
mm. um, the remit of, of NIHR, and it should be if you if you're doing research to go on to do a suitable or sorry to, to use to go on to do a PhD in the future, um, then again it should be the type of research that NIHR would fund at PhD level. So if you're again if you're not sure on that, if you're thinking mm. actually is this the kind of thing that NIHR would fund at PhD level, then then please do get in touch because obviously if you're spending the time to put in this application. Um, with the thought that you'll apply for a PhD fellowship in the future, it's important to know that that PhD fellowship is something that our child would be would be interested in funding. So, any questions on that specifically, do do get in touch with us. Mm -hmm. uh, someone's asked about costs um, about for for masters. Um, so, as the, yeah, as David mentioned, there's, there is five thousand pounds available for research training costs, but you can, in addition, if you're wanting to do a master's course, um, put in the costs for the master's course itself. So, um, they are two two separate things. So, um, yeah, you can you, you can include both if, if a master's course is what you want to do, in addition to any other training that you might do after the, after the master's. Um, Someone's asked about numbers of applicants versus numbers available. Um, this is the first round we've done this, so it's a bit of an unknown <laughs> at the moment. So I can't ne can't necessarily answer that. Um, details of who has been successful are published on the NHR website at a later date. So that will be available if you're thinking of applying this time next year. But obviously at this time, uh, not. Uh, someone's asked about REF, which I thought when you said it, you might, yeah. you know, there might be a question about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so REF is stands for Research Excellence Framework. Um, this is basically a process which uh, is undertaken across um, universities uh, roughly every sort of seven years. Um, and it's a process for basically assessing the, the research um, outputs um, and the quality of the research that um, particular departments do within a university. Um, so if you simply go into Google and Google REF, you'll be able to find um, the, the ratings of, of the department that you're intending on working at from the last time the exercise yeah. was done, which I think... 2014, was it? 2014, yeah, that's, yeah, I think that's right. Um, so how, if, you, if, you're, if you're unsure, um, your, again, your supervisor will be able to help with that. And because the, your supervisor is able to basically have access to all parts of the application form the same way as you are, um, they can help put that together in terms of the sort of the statement of why this is a particularly good department for you to be based in, for example. So one of the parts of the answer to that might well be that this department scored X in the, the last research excellence framework, just to highlight the fact that it's a strong department for the, the area that you're wanting to work in. But yeah, in yeah. summary, effective, it is, it's a way of identifying whether actually the department you're wanting to work in does have a recognised uh, sort of high, high quality research in the area that you're looking to get training in. Uh, so the next question is, is it advised that when writing statements for the application that you write the f uh, in bullet point structure? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I think that's sort of a general comment in terms of how you would fill in the questions. Yes, it, it is. It is probably advisable to to try and uh, split out your your answers to make it readable for panels. Um, mm -hmm. Bearing in mind that the, the the people who are assessing this will be reading a number of different applications, so I think they always appreciate any any sort of way of actually structuring the the um, your application to make it a bit more readable. So big huge blocks of text that okay. never go down too well. <laughs> I'd probably suggest as well getting other people to read over it because um, mm -hmm. I think you can always read and go a bit of sort of blind to your own application um, so just make sure you get plenty to read it make sure that it says exactly what you want it to say and, and sells you or the host and the supervisor exactly how you want to be sold. Mm -hmm. um, uh, someone's asked about if they have a PhD in a different discipline um, could you then use this to undertake a master's? Um, so yes, you can if you're using it as a as a bit of a career change. So you, you know, you might have a PhD in modern art, for example. I don't know whatever, whatever it may be, something completely unrelated to, um, say, health economics, um, and you've you're wanting to do a career change. Yes, absolutely. So that that's really about should you would articulate that in the application form as to why you're now looking to go down 
this particular route um, in terms of your your future career. But yeah, that, that that's abs that's absolutely absolutely fine. Um, someone's asked, can you give examples of what people have gone on to do after the program? Um, not this one specifically. As I said, this is the first time we've launched this in its current form. Um, but in terms of its predecessors that David was talking to before, so things like the, the Research Methods Fellowships and the Masters in Medical Statistics, um, after those, people have gone in to do a number of things. Some, some people have gone on to do PhD fellowships with us, so they've been successful at the, the doctoral level fellowships. Um, some people have gone on to work for clinical trials units. Uh, that's been quite a common one, for, certainly for people who um, are, are doing things like medical statistics, for example. Um, Other people have gone into a sort of private industry. So um, a few, few uh, health economists that I can think of have gone on to work for pharma companies, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so there's quite a wide range, and that sort of is, is hopefully reflected in terms of the scope of this fellowship, that it recognises that having done this fellowship, people will go on to do a different, a, a wide range of different things. It's about your sort of starter in, in this sort of, this sort of field for your career. So it's not, although it's called a pre-doctoral fellowship in the title, um, it's more about the career stage, not saying that it's a precursor to doing a doctoral fellowship, if that, if that makes sense. Um, someone's asked about interviews. No, it, it, it is just a one stage process. So, you would apply with this application form. It's assessed by the panel members, and then there's a meeting um, to make a decision over which applications you fund. So no, there's no, there's no interview for this. Um, someone's asked about, um, I, I presume this next question is probably more to do with PCAF, but I'll, I'll cover it anyway. Um, someone who's been on a NHR funded MClean Res program um, and they're a, they're a paramedic. So if you're a paramedic and you're looking to do an MClean Res, I, th I would suggest that um, anyone who falls into that bracket is um, better looking at the pre-doctoral clinical academic fellowship, unless, of course, just to repeat what I said earlier, that you're looking to do a career change into research methodology. Um, in terms of top tips for being successful at doctoral level, though, which is what the, which the question is about, um, we could probably do a whole webinar on that as well, to be honest. Um, and I, so, I mean, that is one thing. Look at we do have other webinars that we've done on, on different different topics in, in, in this sense. But um, actually, similar to what we've been talking about today, a, a lot of it is really articulating in your application form what it is that you're wanting to to do with the fellowship. Obviously, for the doctoral fellowship, the main output is going to be award of a PhD. Um, so it is doing research that is suitable for PhD level. Um, and articulating where you're looking to go in your in your career beyond that, um, as well as building in a suitable training program that fits around side the research you're doing within your PhD. Um, so without wanting to spend um, a great deal of time on this question, because as I say, there's lots of things to, to think about here. Um, yeah, we do have some other information on the website about this, and I'd also encourage people to get in touch with us too, yeah. if that's if that's what they're thinking about doing. And probably speak to your local uh, research design service as well, your R mm. RDS. Uh, they'll probably have good examples of previous uh, pre previous people who've held the award, and uh, they might offer some sort of webinars or certainly seminars um, to show you what 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 makes up a, a good application. So. Mm -hmm. Like you do now, actually, though, just ask lots of questions, speak to lots of people. Someone's asked about the maximum length of funding. Um, is it one year or can it be longer? Yeah, so it can be uh, it can be up to two years. Um, so, for instance, as you said, you can apply for eighteen months up to full time. That'd be absolutely fine. Um, what you need to do though is just justify uh, why you're given that length of time. So, for example, it could be a maximum of two years if you're doing a year um, doing a master's level course and then doing a year's worth of training and development that would be absolutely fine and you'd also be able to do that 50 percent of the time so in effect your award would be held for four years and um, so again just make sure that your application really sets out why you're using that time and as pete said earlier whether it's good value for money as well um so they're the main things to consider when you're looking at the length of the award not just say i'll take two years for and do it for present the time just because i can it needs to be uh, come across really well while, while you're doing that. Someone's asked about what is a relevant degree, which I think is, is a good question. Um, so they use the, the example of geology and, and biology. Um, so not necessarily linked too closely to health. 
Um, in in that sense, it's it's actually part of the application for you to sort of demonstrate the skills that you may have got from your undergraduate training that make you then suitable for what you're wanting to do next. So if you're doing a, I don't know what necessarily your what master's course you might be looking to do as part of this, but um, it, it's about sort of, yeah, as I say, it's, it's about bringing it out in your application in terms of the more general skills as to why why you are then in a suitable position to go on to do the master's course that you're looking to do. Um, so both those subjects are quite quite scientific subjects, so you may well have been done quite a lot of relevant relevant or gained a lot of relevant skills, which would make you um, sort of suitable for doing a whatever master's course that you're looking to do. So yeah, bring that out in the application. Um, it's about making the case really. There's not a there's not a set list of these mm -hmm. uh, undergraduate courses are suitable or these ones are not. Um, someone's asked, does a supervisor need to be an NHR senior investigator? Uh, no, is the short answer. Um, NHR senior investigators who are interested in supervising are on the website as, as people to potentially approach if you haven't already identified a supervisor. Uh, but they certainly don't have to be. Yep. Um, but yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's... But it probably is sensible to speak to people who are aware of the NHR schemes, um, just so they understand the process. Um, so it's not necessary, but it might help mm -hmm. in terms of putting your application together mm -hmm. and what the panel members might be looking for. Even if they're not part of the supervisor team, mm -hmm. it might be worth speaking to people who, who are familiar. Mm -hmm. um, someone's asked, can I apply for this fellowship if I've previously received NHR funding for a master's? Um, so this might be someone who's done a medical statistics funded MS place or a health economics funded MS master's place. Uh, yes is the short answer to this. Um, again, as I think we've said um, in the answer to some of the other questions, it's, it's about showing the benefit that this fellowship will bring. So if you've done a master's course in medical stats and you're looking to use the fellowship to gain some further skills and training before you maybe apply for a PhD, for example, it's about showing the benefit and the reasons why you need to do this fellowship and what, what, what difference it will make. So yes, but do make sure you, you show the, the value that the fellowship will bring. Are there differences in funding between UK and EU students' eligibility criteria? Um, there's not differences in funding. Um, the important thing is to check your eligibility to live and work in the UK for the duration of the fellowship with your host organisation. Um, so, yeah, that's a that's a question for your host organisation. So I would I would I would talk to them. Um, but provided that you are, um, no, the funds the funds are the same for both, and there's certainly no. From our point of view, if you're if you're eligible to live and work in the UK for the fellowship, there's there's no um, there's no difference in terms of where, where you're where you're coming from in that sense. Um, so someone's asking when the next round will be. So yeah, it will be next year. It's only held once a year, so um, the next round will be February. But if you have missed it this year. Uh, hopefully these these webinars and sort of the information that we're providing will sort of set you up well for, for applying next year and give you that sort of good head start mm -hmm. to, to start early and start identifying your supervisors now if you, mm -hmm. if you know this is what you want to do um, then there's no harm in starting super early and getting yourself set for, for next year. Mm -hmm. Someone's asked about the uh, signature process in terms of supervisor signature process, is, is that electronic? Yes, it is. So um, there's the online grant tracker system that we use is called Aramis. And uh, when you apply or when you start your application online, you'll be able to name your supervisors and uh, they'll be able to get a, an email uh, asking them to sign up to Aramis. And then it'll all be online electronic signatures. And that'll be the same for your finance signatories and also the, the head of department signatories as well. Um, so again, it's worth setting them up earlier. Uh, sooner rather than later so then all it is when it comes to sign off is just a couple of clicks of of the mouse button mm -hmm. rather than uh trying to log on and put your details on so if you know who they'll be get them get them set up with aramis straight away they might need a bit of guidance um so yeah the more time the better for that yeah um someone's asked about um i think the questions around potentially alternative funding for the msc given when outcomes will be known so i said well outcomes should be known in in july um, so should they proceed with um, student finance for the proposed MSC? I, I think that question means, if, uh, assuming they weren't funded 
would they have something else in place? I mean, yes, I would certainly recommend, if that's what you're asking, uh, to have alternatives um, set up um, in case you weren't successful. So if you know you want to do a particular master's course, for example, and you weren't successful in doing it through this fellowship, if you are able to do it in other ways, then it's always worthwhile having a having a plan B, um, uh, say, if, if that's what this question is asking. Uh, next question. I'm just going to come back to that one in a second. Um, so this one is, is what weight slash importance is given to the seniority experience of those named as supervisors? I don't know if you want to take that one, David, if that's all right. Uh, yes, can be. So, um, and again, it's very much in terms of what you've put into um, what you've put into your application. Um, so, if your supervisor seems well placed and has the experience. That you're needed to to guide you through your fellowship, uh, then that will absolutely fine. So it's um, it's very much more about what what the training and development you'll be able to do. So that's very much the the main priority and what you offer um, for non from this fellowship, um, and whether those senior people or your supervisors would you be would be able to actually uh, guide you through that process. So it's much more about uh, the relationship between the training development you're uh, proposing and, and the supervisor. Being in the world's best place, but if if you're in doubt, speak to your supervisor. They'll be honest enough to tell you whether they feel as though they're experienced enough, or whether you should seek other supervisors alongside them. Uh, Brilliant, thank you. Um, someone's asked a question around: um, Can it be used for effectively developing your research question ahead of doing a PhD? So, sort of the work you'd want to do to prepare for that, um, and not just sort of more formal training. Uh, yes, yes, absolutely, it can be used for that. So, if if you are if you already have in mind the type of PhD you want to do in terms of the research question, but aren't quite ready yet to apply, then yes, you can very much use this this fellowship to to develop that further. Um, if you are using it for that purpose, I would I would you know encourage to think think about some additional sort of formal training that you can do alongside that. So make, don't just make it all about one thing or the other. It's probably worthwhile having a mix of sort of that refining the research question, but. Um, can be punctuated with some some specific training, uh, whether that be formal or maybe visiting another another centre, for example, to get some experience in a particular um, methodology or technique, depending on what you're wanting to do. So, no, but it very much can be used for that to help refine your question ahead of ahead of applying to a to us for a fellowship. Uh, so, yeah, the, this next question is sort of linked to that, which is, do you need to have a research proposal worked up for the application? No, you don't um, say because this you may you may well be coming to this very much from someone who is straight from their undergraduate degree and is purely looking to use it to get some training around um, say medical statistics and basing that around a medical statistics master's. In which case, you may well do a, a, a research project as part of the um, master's course. So you can detail some of what that may look like as part of the application. Mm -hmm. the supervisor can help you. Help you put that together, but we're not expecting people to come to us with a research proposal already worked out. Like my answer to the previous question, if you are using it to further refine your PhD question, so you're a bit further on in your career, you already maybe you already have your master's, um, then for, in that sense, it may it probably makes more sense for you to give us a bit more information about the type of research you want to do at PhD level, because that helps explain what you're wanting to use the fellowship for. If that makes sense. So, bearing in mind the range of things that people can use this fellowship for, it would depend on how much we're expecting you to have done in terms of preparing the, the research for PhD level. Someone's asked, how many fellowships will we be awarding? Um, it, we don't have a set number. So, basically, how this works is we would, um, or the panel rather, they they make recommendations as to how many would be uh, fundable uh, and then they would rank those ones and then we would fund up to the level of the budget that we have and um, so it would depend very much on the cost of individual awards as to how many how many we will we will fund um so yeah we can't we can't necessarily say at this at this stage how many will be awarding but details of who mm -hmm. has been funded will be on the website at a at a later date Um, someone's asked about patient and public involvement activities, um, and which will require to be developed ahead. I think, yeah, so developed ahead of a doctoral mm -hmm. application. So um, if you're asking about patient and public involvement activities, um, 
yeah, in, in advance of applying for a doctoral fellowship. Um, yes, you, you, you probably could cover use it for that. Uh, again, it would fall into the bracket of um, preparatory work for doing a, um, a full PhD fellowship. Um, again, like I was saying earlier, in terms of building training into that too, I think both patient and public involvement activities of actually working with a patient group, for example, but I think if you, as part, bearing in mind the training nature of these fellowships, it would be good to build in an actual training around patient involvement yeah. in that too. So think, think about both aspects. Uh, conference fees allowance within our, sorry, our conference fees uh, within the £5,000 budget or additional. The, in addition to that as well. So yeah, so you have your 5000 for for training and development that you want to do, and then you also have an additional for a £1,000 uh, conference fees. So it's 6000 in total. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think this question has been covered about asking could someone use the uh, fellowship to support developing a doctoral fellowship application alongside completing modules for skills that you're currently missing. Yeah, absolutely. I think yeah, that's a very legitimate use of the fellowship. Probably won't need to say any more on that. I think we've covered that. Um, I've not yet completed my BSc, but I will have in June. Can I apply? So that that is a that is a good question. Um, Yes, you can is the short answer, um, but any award would be conditional on having your um, result. So it may, if you if you get your um, degree outcome in between applying and having been told of the outcome, obviously let us know. Um, but if you haven't yet had it by the time you let us know, then we would we would make anything conditional on that, on having that. And you'd also have to have like the sort of formal agreement in place with your host institution as well. Uh, so make sure they're, they're aware of the situation and what the conditional offer is from the, the NIHR if you were to be successful. Uh, so I think looking for the next, I think someone's asked, uh, yeah, someone else has asked about PPI, so I'll, I think we've probably covered that one. Um, bear with me a second. So someone's asked, I'm interested in infectious disease modelling and I'm currently in the process of organising my application with a HEI and a research group to HEI um, to do this. I believe an MSc in epidemiology uh, would be, yeah, so you're saying you've been accepted onto an MSc in epidemiology. Uh, would this be acceptable? Um, yes, again, the short answer would be yes, um, as long as you can sort of, um, say, describe how it fits within the scope of the... Um, of the of the fellowship uh, that we that we talked about mm -hmm. at the beginning in terms of the different methodologies, then yeah, you could that would sounds like it would be that sounds like it would be suitable. Yeah, so going back to that list that we have in the guidelines and what was at the start of the um, the webinar, I guess it doesn't need just be very specific in one of those areas. If like epidemiology might cover a number of them different research methodologies, mm -hmm. then then that's absolutely fine as well. So it doesn't have to be just slowly solely in one of those mm -hmm. categories. It can it can be a mix of of them all, as long as it's some sort of research methodology training. Yeah. Someone's asked a question about, does your host organisation need to be based in England? Uh, yes, they do. Um, but can the training providers be based outside of England? Uh, yes, they can. So um, yes, your host needs to be based in England. But if you, for example, have found a suitable master's course or whatever other type of training elsewhere, then you could very much include that. If you are including, for example, um, something that's based abroad, uh, one thing you would have to do, obviously the same amount of money is still available, so obviously there's that to consider, but also just to justify as to why a particular course is, is the best place for you to go and do um, this particular award, um, so the panel will look at that, so don't just put down going to do, I don't know, a, a course over in the States, um, because it's there if you are doing that, yeah, but actually that is widely regarded as being the best place to do that particular training, then um, that's perfectly legitimate as long as it's as long as that's clear. Um, we are coming up to the end of the webinar, unfortunately, so I've probably got time for just one more question. Um, so just bear with me a second. I'll just see if there's any ones that we haven't necessarily covered. Um, someone's asked about: Do we need a clinical supervisor as well as a research methodologist? Um, it depends on. A if you're a clinician, I think going back to what we said earlier about whether you're applying to the right award, whether it's PCAF or pre-doctoral, 
Um, if, if this is a question about PCAF, then yes, you do need a clinical supervisor, but for pre-doctoral, no, you don't. Um, it may well be sensible to have someone with a more clinical background if, if you're, for example, using the fellowship to work up a PhD application and you want someone from a particular disease area that you're working with, then in that sense, it may well so it make sense to have someone with a more clinical um, experience on your team. But it's the, it's those who can best support your, your methodology training, which is the key thing to include here. Um, so it's come up to two o'clock. So unfortunately, I'm sorry, there is still quite a number of questions that we've not managed to get through, but thank you very much for everything that you have submitted. Um, what we will try and aim to do is um, answer those questions uh, separately. Um, either by responding to them directly um, through the, the webinar software or posting them up um, online afterwards. Um, but if you have got a burning question which you, 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 do, do, you do need to ask us about, please do get in touch with the, with the details that David just popped up on the screen there. So drop us an email, give us a call, um, and we'll be more than happy to, to take your questions. But thank you very much for listening. I hope, hope that's been helpful and all the best with your applications. Yeah, good luck. Thanks very much. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.